It's the study in the church calendar when we reflect back to that time when the faithful and earth-shattering questions were asked. The church was in need of some dramatic rethinking. It required some strong and passionate voices to call out the failures of those who claimed to follow Jesus, but whose life did not reflect such a calling. Today is even more important because it is the 500th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation. Names like Martin Luther, John Calvin, William Tyndale, Ulrich Zwingli are some of those great voices. But today marks the anniversary of Martin Luther nailing the 95 Theses to the door of the Wittenberg Church. This event was the proverbial stone in the pond that caused both ripples and waves. It burdened so many churches and denominations, including our own. Let us celebrate those who felt called to reform the church. And let us learn from them in our own small reformations that will lead for greater faithfulness. Please stand as you're able and join with us in our first hymn. Thank you. 
came up after the service, or there was a table set out, set up just beyond the sanctuary with a box where you can fill out the card and drop that card into the box. This is really important as we do our work in establishing the church budget. So please be prayerful about that, and if you can, get that turned in today. Our scripture this morning comes from Romans, the first chapter. The very, the seventh verse, just that one verse. I invite you now to hear these words. For in it, the it being here, the gospel. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed through faith, for faith. As it is written, the one who is righteous will live by faith. May these words resonate within us and then re reinvigorate our individual faith and in doing so strengthen our collective faithfulness. Let us join our voices now in song. And looking at that verse from Romans, 
the one who is righteous will live by faith. The way Martin Luther read that was that he would never be able to live the life of faith because he would never be able to achieve the righteousness of God. There was nothing he could do to get himself to that place of right standing. Well, as you can guess, Martin Luther eventually had a moment of transformation. But before I speak about that transformation, I thought it might be helpful to understand what it was that Martin did 500 years ago this coming Tuesday. And I invite you to watch this short video clip. <coughs> Wealth of knights, father in Christ and most illustrious prince, forgive me that I should dare to write to you. I make bold because it is my duty to serve you and to warn you of the crooked practices of those who claim to represent your grace. If only they have the right whatever, 
If you just have the right amount of money, or if you have the right ritual, the right prayers, the right confession, the right set of rules, the right liturgy, the right preacher, then you can receive God's love and stand right before God. It seems strange to me that the church, those that claim to follow Jesus Christ, those that claim to be the body of Christ in the world, would practice legalism. Because so much of the ministry of Jesus was about confronting and dismantling legalism found in religion. In John's Gospel, the fourth chapter, Jesus encounters a Samaritan woman. Now it's important to know that the Jews and Samaritans did not, did not get along. They did not get along at all, and they considered the other to be the antithesis of faith and faithfulness. Samaritan people, they worshipped on Mount Gerizim, while Jews, of course, worshipped in Jerusalem. And both of them took a legalistic look at where proper worship was to be held. No, our place is correct. No, ours is. If you worship over there, you're worshiping in the wrong place, and God won't pay attention to you. God won't love you. But the woman that Jesus encountered, the Samaritan woman who he encountered there at the well, said, our ancestors worshiped on this mountain, but you and your people say it's necessary to worship in Jerusalem. <coughs> Jesus said to her, Believe me, woman, the time is coming when you and your people will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. The time is coming, and in fact it is here, Jesus said, when true worshipers will worship in spirit and truth. It's Jesus' way of saying, Don't get legalistic about the place you worship, or how you worship, or other aspects of worship. But what has happened? What has happened even in the last couple hundred years? Many Protestant churches have taken that phrase about worshiping in spirit and truth and embraced it to the point of becoming overly legalistic about what it means to worship in spirit and truth. No, we have the correct way of worshiping in spirit and truth. They don't over there. They've got it all wrong. You've got to do this thing. You've got to follow this practice. You've got to say it this way. They've argued and fought over what it looks like to worship in spirit and truth. What is it about us as human beings that makes us so driven towards a legalistic righteousness? And yet Martin Luther, a man that bought into it, that struggled with it, that continually felt guilty because he could not achieve it, had his transformative moment with those words from Romans. The one who is righteous will live by faith. What Martin Luther came to understand was how righteousness was not something to be achieved, but received. Righteousness was not something that we accomplish, but something already accomplished in Jesus Christ and given to us as a gift from God through God's grace. And spiritual practices... Spiritual practices like prayer and fasting and meditation and worship are, not, are never intended to be strictly followed in a way that one thinks, I'll get, to, I'll get to heaven, or I'll earn God's love, or I'll be in right standing with God if only I do them correctly. Spiritual practices are a means by which one better enjoys God's love, is better able to embrace God's love, and then through that is able to better share that love with others. Back in early August, just back from vacation, I was in the office. What was the office? 
And the phone rang. It was a Friday. I was all alone, and I answered the phone. And, and I'll just tell you, I get these calls. Staff here gets these calls. But the person asked for clarification. I heard you have women ministers at your church. I said with a little pride, yes, yes we do. To which the person on the other side of the call said, are they real ministers or are they just overseeing women's tasks like cleaning the church and preparing the sanctuary for worship? <laughs> I can see that it set you off to where it's set you just a little. And this is where, and I will confess, I fibbed. I fibbed a little bit. Because I said, oh no, it's my job to clean the church. <laughs> and to prepare the space for sanctuary. And we have some mighty fine good women preachers here at this church. And after a lengthy silence, I was told I needed to study the Bible hmm? and repent. <laughs> My question is, why are so many people threatened? Threatened by, in this case, amazingly gifted women who have been empowered by the Spirit to be clergy. Threatened by people and situations and thinking and have become very legalistic. Threatened people begin searching for ways that they can narrowly earn God's love. That they can earn right standing before God. If only we don't do this, if only we do this. If only we exclude them, if only we think this way, if we only practice that. All I need to do is follow the rules well enough. I only need to defend the lines of purity correctly. I only need to say the right words and say them with the right intensity. I know I only need to have a certain set of rituals and to do them in a profound way. I only need to have the correct posture when I pray. I, I only need to do this, and then I'm okay before God. People get so caught up trying to do religion right so that they can feel right, that they miss out on what makes a person right, which is the gift of God's love in Jesus Christ. Period. Nothing more. And Luther discovered, by God's gift of love in Jesus, he can let go of this overwhelming sense of guilt, of not measuring up. And what <coughs> happened in the church was because people felt guilty, they thought they could overcome their guilt by pushing others out and creating this very restricted, narrow pathway. And what Martin Luther did is he encountered the grace of God in that gift of love in Jesus Christ, that <coughs> gift that gave him right standing before God. And then, and only then, could he live as a joyful and humble servant of that gift. Phyllis Tickle is a Christian author and, and historian. She wrote a book a while back called The Great Emergent. And in that book, she suggests every 500 years or so, religion has a rummage sale. Going back to the monarchy and King David, and 500 or so years later, later, the Israelites returning from exile, about 539 B.C., and restructuring what faith looked like. And then around zero, Jesus showing up and changing everything. And then the Romanization of Christianity in the 5th century, though I would suggest that was a step backwards, there was the great schism between East and West in 1054 AD and then the Reformation in 1517. Every 500 years or so, the church, finding a few brave souls 
who are willing to look through the spiritual closet of the institution and recognize a lot of unnecessary and unhealthy baggage that it was carrying. And guess what? It was often, most often, some sort of legalism that came out of people's feeling of being threatened, a legalism that became the only pathway to their defined understanding of what it meant to be righteous. And such a tight grip they held, some tight grip on religious practice, a narrow view of correctness, some skewed understanding of rightness, that that tight grip squeezed every ounce of love and grace and mercy out of religion. Walls were built to show that narrow pathway, and those walls excluded so many. You were either on the path or you were not, and many were not. But then came someone who was touched by the Spirit, someone who glimpsed rightness, not as something we achieve, but something we receive as a gift. But every time we take a few steps forward, there are those who push back with some newfound legalistic path to right standing, a path and process <laughs> that is nothing more than a, a caustic and cruel legalism covered in new wrappings. Suddenly, another group, another segment of society, another category of people is left out because they don't know how to properly do whatever it is that will make them right before God. And yet Paul, the Apostle Paul, is the one who said, every one of us falls short of the glory of God, and thus the reason for grace. I've shared with some of you this story before, but in the latter months of World War II, in a town that was predominantly Jewish in Europe, there was a Catholic nun that had served that community well, had helped to protect the people, had provided food in times of need, and even had hid some of them. In those final months of World War II, she died. And some of the people from the community went to the religious leaders and asked by chance if she could be buried of all she did, she could be buried in the Jewish cemetery. And it was decided that no, she could not because, well, she didn't quite fit what was understood as what was necessary to be buried there. But, just beyond the fence of the cemetery, there was a beautiful tree. And they recommended that she be buried there under the tree. And so a few days later, a beautiful service was held there underneath the tree. The next morning, people got up and wandered out, and they were startled to see that someone had moved the tree. <laughs> the tree was inside the fence. And then as they got closer, they realized that during the night, someone had moved the fence to include her The church keeps on putting up fences of properness and rightness and correctness, thinking that we can find our own pathway to stand before God. If only we do the right stuff, hold the right things, we build these walls, we set up these fences, we create this straight pathway. And yet what we realize is that none of us can do it on our own. And thus the reason that God has stepped in in Christ Jesus to make that relationship right for us. And yet how many of you have been told at one time or another that you are not right with God because you don't practice this, because you think this way, because you have this attitude. If only you would do X, then you would be right before God. Well, another 500 years has passed, folks. It's time for another reformation, especially in the face of a new re 
resurgence of legalism. We need a reformation, a little rummage sale within the church that puts out at the street for anyone to pick up some of the baggage that we have been carrying for far too long. And to realize and to embrace again the wonderful news that we have been set right with God through the gift of God's love in Jesus Christ. End of the story. That's all there is. And then when one embraces that and celebrates that, they can begin to live humbly as servants of that marvelous gift. Not believing that I serve to earn that right place. It's a response to the marvelous gift that God has already set me right in that relationship. It's a whole different way of thinking. And yet as you look at the history of Christianity, legalism, this kind of overly high righteousness, continues to work its way into the church. And we need a reformation. We need to find a way of preaching the gospel of God's grace and love and to help people understand that in Christ Jesus they have been made right with God. The relationship is there. Now live in that joyous news. Live as humble servants of that gift. We join the prayer. It is with humility and an overwhelming joy that we receive your gift of love, a merciful and generous God. Each of us will fall short of achieving the beautiful ideal seen in Jesus. We'll falter and we will fail, no question about it, yet you do not require us to make it right. You, gracious Lord, have already made it right by your gift of Christ Jesus who gave everything, including his life, to demonstrate the depth of your love. You have freed us to live in the joy of that gift, to honor your gift by representing the gift, your gift, in our, in our words, in our actions. Help us to live a life that allows others to see how how it's all a gift through you. Some days it's hard. So many voices that want to make us feel guilty. So many people that are feeling threatened who want to make us feel threatened. Who want to tell us that we're wrong, that we're on the wrong path. Lord God, continue to just keep us in that place of grace place that celebrates how you have gifted us all through Jesus Christ our Lord. It is in his name that we now pray together the prayer he shared, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us
It's no use running in the aisle in the opposite direction. I think too often we've gotten on the train of legalism, and people have tried to run down the aisle in the opposite direction, thinking that that is somehow going to help. They feel trapped, and eventually they're going to hit the caboose and go no further. Sometimes you've got to get on the train <coughs> and go find what is correct, to board the train of grace and love and goodness and goodness. <laughs> We need to find our place there with God, where God whispers to us anew that we are loved unconditionally, that there's nothing we can do to get to that place. In fact, it's already been done on our behalf. Now enjoy it, embrace it, celebrate it, and then humbly serve that marvelous. There's no better place, in my opinion, in the context of worship, discovering that truth is at the table. Because we do not set any sort of narrow path to the table. We don't say, this group is welcome and that is not. That you have to accept this creed or that one. We simply, in the name of a gracious God, say all are welcome at this table. All are welcome at this table because we all find right standing before God, not because of anything we've done, but because of what Jesus Christ has done. Let us now prepare ourselves for a time at the table. <laughs>
tithes and offerings, and any gifts that you might wish to share. In a moment, as we receive these elements, if you're unable to come forward, please raise your hand and we will bring the elements to you. We do have gluten-free elements here in the middle for any who may so require. But the moment has now come. Let us open our minds and our hearts to the presence of the living Christ. Let us pray. Lord, we pray that you would still our minds and quiet our hearts as we approach this table today. We ask that you would draw each one of us into even closer fellowship with you as we partake together of the bread and the wine in grateful remembrance of what you did for each one of us on Calvary's cross. Amen. <coughs> It was by love and not by law that the night which Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread in the company of the disciples, and he broke it. And he said, Take heat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, he took the cup, and after having blessed it, he passed it to his disciples, saying, Drink, this is my life, this is the new covenant that God is making with you. Do this in remembrance.
Dear Lord, we are the receivers, receivers of love, receivers of grace, receivers of Jesus. We are the givers, following God's call, following Jesus, following our hearts. Lord, we give these offerings for the work of your kingdom with humble thanks for the mercies we have received. Martin Luther was an amazing individual who helped to at least start the Reformation. As his life went on, of course he was not popular, and so he found himself threatened quite often. He was in hiding sometimes. He was being protected other times. And because he felt threatened, as he got older, he became a bit paranoid. And he also became very fearful. And out of that, sadly, as you read some of his later writings, he starts excluding people again. Those people are horrible. Those are, are outside of God's grace. They are, and I think it just points to how vulnerable we are when we feel threatened and afraid how quickly we get back into that narrow path of thinking we can achieve it only if we follow these certain steps. Everyone else is outside of that. And that's the reason we continually need, probably more often than every 500 years, probably every 15 minutes, we need a reformation. <laughs> we need to have our spirits reformed in the grace and love of God. And it is through that gift that every Sunday we extend an invitation, an invitation to bring one's life into a community of faith that is attempting to live out that love that we experience in Jesus Christ. We don't do it perfectly, and we know that in any attempt to do so, we would fall short. We simply come together with great gratitude, recognizing the gift that has been given to us, and then trying to the best of our ability to live as humble servants of that gift. If you desire to connect your life with this congregation, give your life to Jesus Christ, you can do so either by coming forward as we sing or by meeting with our, of our elders or pastors out in the lobby at the close. Let us now join our voices.
about what we can do again. What changes happened then that might help us now? I do want to remind you again about our journey of generosity. There are cards and tables as soon as you leave, as well as a center table out here with a box on it where you can drop those cards. It really helps us as we think about stewardship for 2018. And as you can guess, things are very different this year. And so having a good sense of where we are as a church, where we think we will be, is incredibly helpful. So anything you can do with that would be a great help. Let us now join hands and join together in our closing prayer. Gracious God, may your love and our lives come together in a life of living love. May Jesus be our mentor and our model, and may the world see in us a life that is willing to put love first in all things. Amen. Yeah.